All right, uh, we're going to get into chapter 10 um, today. And uh, chapter 10 is, is about hypothesis testing. Said another way, um, someone is going to make a claim about a population mean or a population proportion. It could be that for a population proportion, someone could make the claim that um, you know, Donald Trump is going to get 48% of the popular vote. Could be. Um, the only way that we can confirm that claim is to go collect some data and see if our data conforms to the claim. Someone could make a claim that the average uh, salary of a household is $52,000. Well, that's just a claim. And what we're going to do as statisticians is we're going to test the claim. So another way to stay, another way to describe hypothesis testing is that we are going to be testing claims about a population uh, in this chapter, either a single population mean or a single population proportion. But someone has to make a mathematical statement that involves numbers that deals with either the average or deals with the percentage, proportion or, or the average. Someone can make a claim about an average salary. Someone can make a claim about the percentage of the vote that someone would get. All right, here's how the process is going to work. It's going to be a five-step process, and learning how to, to, to go through these five steps. If you can go through these five steps, then you will have the information that you need to, to test a claim. And so uh, I'll describe the five steps. In section 10.1, you kind of get the, uh, the intro. Um, that means writing hypotheses. and something about a type one, type two error, what it means to make an error. And, you know, interpreting the results, that is stating a conclusion. And then um, in the other two sections, 10.1 or 10.2 and 10.3, 10.2 is going to be devoted only to the, to the population proportion, claims being made about a population proportion. And then uh, section 10.3 will be, will be testing claims about population means. So here's how we start. This is the second part of statistical inference. And the second part of statistical inference um, accompanies the confidence intervals. So confidence intervals, chapter 9, that's the first part of statistical inference. We take a sample, we get a sample result, we infer the results to a larger group with a larger population. And uh, then chapter 10 and moving forward is on the hypothesis test. But we start with a population and we take a sample. All right, so first of all, someone starts off with a claim. And um, so maybe, um, maybe the claim is that Donald Trump uh, will receive, let's say, 48% um, of the election vote. Now, the only way that we can um, confirm or deny that result, someone just makes a claim, we're like, well, I don't know if it's true or I don't know if it's false. What we're going to do is we're going to go find some evidence. We need to find some evidence to be able to test this claim. And the evidence we want to, we want to find involves going and taking a sample, a random sample from the population, and then calculating the sample proportion from that. Now, here's how this is all linked to what we've done in the past. If somebody claims that 48% of the vote will go to Donald Trump, then we know something about the sampling distribution. We know that, um, let's say in our sample, if we take 1,000 in our sample, we would calculate the number that voted for, for Donald Trump. And so we're going to assume 
that 48% is in fact the true population proportion. That's what we're assuming to be true because someone made that claim. Now, we could calculate the standard error you know, using a formula, this formula here, and I'm just going to estimate it here, and maybe we find it to be 0 0.02. So we can then use that 0 0.02 and add it, add it, add it three times. So this would be 0 0.50 and 0 0.52 and 0 0.54. Going on the other side, 0 0.46, 0 0.44, and 0 0.42. Now we know uh, from our work, this is the, the if, if we took this one sample and we plotted it, let's say that when we uh, calculated, we did our one sample, we found, let's say um, 497, 497 said that they plan to vote for Donald Trump. So then we would calculate X over N and we would get 0.497. This is one sample of many we could have taken, but we did find that one. And when we plot it, it's right here. 0.497 is very close to 0 0.50. Now, if we did this again, we would generate all these sample proportions. So what if we did a different one and we ended up with say uh, 410? Then if we calculated the sample proportion and took 410 over 1,000, we would end up with 0.41. Well, 0.41 would be way over here. That's fine. We know that within two standard deviations about, we're gonna have 95% of all the samples. So here's how we're gonna make our decision. If we find a sample proportion like 0 .4, uh, 0.497 that falls in this range, in this 95% range, we're going to say, you know what, this is this is plausible if the sample or if the population proportion is 0.48. So we we will say that anything in here, um, any sample proportion that we find in here, um, not enough evidence to uh, reject that the population proportion is equal to 0.48, because we found something close to 0.48. If this is true, if 0.48 is the population proportion, then we would get a sample proportion like this just by random sampling variation. Take another sample, take another sample, calculate the sample proportion, do it over and over again. Most of your sample proportions would be in here if this is true. So any sample proportion that we fall, find that is within say two standard deviations or some other version, some other, you know, it's really based on the critical value. So it might not be exactly two standard deviations away from the mean. And if we shrink this to 90%, then, you know, you know that you're going to have a smaller range. So we will be changing these numbers. But if a sample proportion falls in this region, we're going to say, ah, not enough evidence to reject the claim. Someone made the claim, we don't have evidence to reject it. On the other hand, if we found this one and we got a sample proportion way out here, we're saying, uh, you know, if 0.48 is true, if 48% if is the percentage that Donald Trump is gonna get in the, the election, then we would not expect to do a random sample and found, find a result way out here. So if we do find a result way out here, then we're gonna say, this is evidence to reject that the population proportion is 0.48. So in the end, we're gonna make a decision and we're gonna say our sample proportion gives us evidence not to reject the claim or it gives us evidence to reject the claim. And then we write up our conclusion. So basically this is the big picture of hypothesis testing. Someone makes a claim, we assume the claim to be true we go take a sample, calculate a sample proportion, and then plot it on the scale to find out if there's evidence to support the claim or evidence to reject the claim. 
And so what we're going to do now is we're going to get into the weeds and I have to explain the five steps of this process. So here's the um, uh, notes um, in e-learning for section 10.1. And we're going to go through some, some problems here, the, uh, the five steps, and I'll continue to um, come back to this. Step number one is to write the hypotheses. Every hypothesis test, uh, and hypotheses is plural. Every hypothesis has two hypotheses, H sub zero and H sub one. Always two, and these are competing hypotheses. They both can't be true at the same time. We have the null hypothesis and H1 is called the alternative. We're going to write the hypotheses. I'll show you how to do that. Step number two is to identify the level of significance. Now, the level of significance is alpha. It's the same alpha that we used in the past, like Z of alpha over two, for example. And alpha is always equal to one minus C, where C is the corresponding confidence level. Most of the time, the level of significance is just given to you in the problem. Step number three is to gather the evidence to help you make the decision or the conclusion of the test. And part of this involves calculating a test statistic. And the test statistic is basically going to be a z-score or a t-score if we're dealing with means. Because the test statistic, the test statistic, if it's a z-score, it tells us how many standard deviations we are away from the means. So if we can calculate that number, we'll know if we're more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So does that put you in the middle region? Does that put you uh, in here? Uh, so anything, any test statistic between negative two and two would put you in here, or is it larger than two or smaller than negative two? Where does that test statistic fall? And the other thing we're going to be calculating is a p-value, and we'll use the technology to calculate that. But that, all this comes in step three, and uh, when the time is right, we'll we'll look at how this relates to what we've done in the past. Uh, step number four is to make the decision. And when we're doing hypothesis testing, it's really a multiple choice. And you have two choices. You're either going to reject the null hypothesis, and that's the H sub zero, or you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And this is not something you choose. You just do it based on the value of the information the test statistic and the p-value, the information that you gathered in step three. All right, so that's step four. And then step five, the last one, is to you know, write the conclusion. You know, what did your whole hypothesis test, what, is it, what did it tell you? So write the conclusion. Uh, another way to say that is to interpret the decision in context the decision that you made in step four in context. So this first section uh, identifies how to write the hypotheses, how to identify the level of significance, and then how to write the conclusion. This is all part of section 10.1. Uh, these other two steps will be um, more specifically outlined when we get to the later sections. All right, so let's start on uh, writing hypotheses and we'll go to some, some examples. There's three different kinds of, of hypothesis tests. In each case, we'll write the null and the alternative hypothesis. Uh, we're gonna have a um, one-tailed left test. We're gonna have a one-tailed right test. And then we're going to have a two-tailed test. And I'll say more about this once we once we do more examples. 
in every hypothesis test, we write two hypotheses, the null and the alternative. And so we're going to just start off by basically just writing these two symbols. And then we're going to write a mathematical statement with an inequality or an equality. And we'll just do proportions. So in my previous example, let's say that the population proportion is equal to 0.48. That's going to be the um, the null hypothesis. What's characteristic of the null hypothesis is that you're going to have an equal sign there. The alternative hypothesis is where there you'll see some difference. So and these have to be competing. So we're going to say in a, in a one tailed left test, we're going to say that if the population proportion is not equal to 0.48, then we think it's going to be less than 0.48. And by less, we mean really less. We mean two standard deviations less or more. So with a, with a left test, you're going to have the less than sign left and less. For a right-tailed test, someone would make a claim, but they would assume the other direction. They would assume that if it's not, if the population proportion is not 0.48, then it's going to be something to the right, something larger, 0 0.49, 0 0.50, something like that. And in a two-tailed test, um, we don't know which, it's, which way it's going to go. The true population proportion may be less than 0.48, or it might be greater than. And the way we designate that is with the not equal to sign. So when writing hypotheses, and we're about to look at some examples, and then we're going to go and write some hypotheses from the problems. Here are some things that you need to keep in mind. And this is for all of these. Uh, number one, uh, the equal sign is in the null hypothesis. The less than, or greater than, less than, or not equal to sign, one of these signs will be in the alternative hypothesis. But the null hypothesis is always the equal sign. Number two, use only population parameters in your hypotheses. So if you're going to make a claim about a population proportion, you know, you want to use P and not P hat. You'll never see P hat. Well, you will, if it's done correctly, you'll never see P hat in a hypothesis. We're always going to use the population proportion. Nobody's ever going to make a claim about a sample because a sample proportion can be anything. Claims are always made about the entire population. Uh, if you're doing mean, you want to use the population mean variable and not X bar. So you'll never see X bar in a hypothesis, only population parameters. And the third rule for hypotheses is that, you know, we're going to write the word claim next to the hypothesis, either the null or the alternative, and that corresponds to the claim. All right, so just remember these three rules, and uh, you'll put you on the right track to write these hypotheses. All right, so you can see here kind of how they did it. Um, Two-tailed test, you got the not equal to, equal to in the null, equal to in the null, equal to in the null. The parameters for our chapter 10 problems will either be um, P or mu. Later we'll, walk, we'll, we'll look at um, other parameters we can use. Left-tailed test uses less than, Left, less, left, less. And then right tail test is greater than. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of examples here in the homework. Go through them. Uh, in these two problems, they're asking you, are you dealing with a 
left tailed test, a right tailed test, or a two tailed test. All right, so the first one, notice that you have the equal sign there. This is a claim about the population mean. The mean is five. The alternative is where you're going to look. So focus in on the alternative hypothesis in each case, all of those. And then all you have to do is look at the, uh, the sign there. Uh, because of the greater than sign, left tailed, right tailed, or two tailed, this one is right because of the greater than sign. If the greater than sign, it's a right tailed test. If you have a left tailed test, then you're going to see the less than. So this is a left tail test. And if you see the not equal to there, that is a two tail test. All right. So we'll be going in a lot more detail about these left tailed, right tailed, and two tailed tests in the future. So it's really just by looking at it less than left, greater than right, not equal to two tailed. All right, now we're going to write the hypotheses. It says determine the null and alternative hypothesis. All right, we'll stop there and we won't go on further to the type one and type two until I come back to it. So number 15, we want to take a look at writing hypotheses. We have the null and the alternative. All right, let's read the problem uh, to come up with how we're going to write the hypotheses. Keep in mind that the null hypothesis will contain the equal to sign and the alternative will contain the less than or greater than or not equal to sign. For students who first enroll in two-year public institutions in the fall of 2007, the proportion who earned a bachelor's degree within six years was point. 399. The president of Joliet Junior College believes that the proportion of students who enroll in her institution have a higher completion rate. All right, so here's a claim that starts off that's being made about a population proportion, the proportion of that earn a bachelor's degree within six years. So the claim is that the proportion is 0.399. This was a result that um, was based on a national study, let's say. And so since this was based on a national study, we're going to assume that the students at Joliet Junior College will graduate at the same rate as the national average, as this close to 40% number here. All right, now here comes the president's claim. The president of the college believes, so if they believe, then they claim uh, that the proportion of students that enroll at Joliet Junior College have a higher completion rate, higher than the 39.9. So the way we're gonna write this is greater than 0.399, and this is the claim. And the P that we're using, is the proportion of Joliet Junior College students uh, that graduate within six years with a um, BA degree. So I'll always ask you to uh, define the variables. And so for this one, read that right well. The, um, the P that we're using here, it's the proportion of Joliet Junior College students they graduate within six years with a baccalaureate degree is what the national average is. The administrator at the college thinks that it's gonna be a lot, little bit larger. So here's the claim that we're gonna test. And that's the first step, write the hypothesis. Okay, I would like you to do one now. Number 35 in the notes. All right, just do part A, part A, ask you to determine the null and alternative hypotheses that would be used to determine if the filling machine is calibrated correctly. And here is the information. The quality control manager wants to verify that the filling machine is neither overfilling or underfilling the cans. A can of soda is labeled 
as having 12 fluid ounces. All right, so what they do is they'll go randomly sample like you know, 300 cans and actually measure the liquid inside the can. You know, one can might have 11.5 ounces. One can might have 12.2 ounces. You know, because they're filled by machines, they're not going to hit 12 ounces perfectly every single time. So the amount of liquid that goes into the, the can varies. Now, if the machine is underfilling consistently, they're going to see an average under 12. If it's overfilling consistent, consistently, then they're going to see an average over 12. If it's filling them with 12 ounces on average and it doesn't need to be recalibrated, then you're going to see some cans that have 12 ounces, some that have a little bit more than 12 ounces, some that have a little bit less than 12 ounces. But on the average, you're going to find that the average amount of, of uh, soda in the can is going to be about 12. Okay, go ahead. I'll give you a couple minutes to uh, think about. Go ahead and write them in the chat. And you can write it as, I don't know, I'll try to write it in there, but H0 colon, and then we will write population proportion equals, um, oh, what is this one? No, not the population proportion this time, it's the mean equals 12. So if, let me hit enter. So there's the null hypothesis. And then if you write the alternative, you can write H1 with a colon and then write the mean is you know greater than 12 or something or, or, or less than 12. Or um, I guess if we write not equal to, we'll write greater than or less than 12, something like that. So go ahead and write the null and alternative hypotheses in the chat so I can see that you're picking this one up. If you don't know, just put a question mark in the chat. This will either tell me that you understand what's going on and we can continue, or you don't understand what's going on. So we should maybe work through a, another example or so. Okay, so April, your um, alternative is missing a variable and Shay and Alexis, okay. Uh, Shay, your alternative is missing the variable. Yeah, that's right, April. You need the mean in there because you're really making a mathematical statement. And without the mean there, you're just saying the alternative hypothesis is not equal to 12. And without the mean not equal to 12, then you're missing a significant part. Okay, so Shay, Alexis, and April are with me still. <laughs> and I see Taylor up there. Again, if you don't know, then put a question mark. Thank you. Okay, 37 is the next one. Okay, so write the two hypotheses for number 37. So for number 35, we have the mean is equal to 12, or the mean is not equal to 12. We don't know if they are underfilling or if they're overfilling. And we really should write the word claim next to one of them. So for number 35, it says that the quality control manager wants to verify that the filling machine is neither overfilling or underfilling. So the claim would be maybe that on average, we're putting the right, right amount of uh, soda in these cans. All right, 37 is the next one. It's about e-cigs, e-cigarettes. Okay, so again, uh, go ahead and put your, um, why don't you just go ahead and put your, um, your alternative hypothesis in the chat. And if you don't know what it would be, just give me a question mark so I know that you're still there and you have questions. Every time we do another example, you learn a little bit more about writing hypotheses. So even if you have questions, still try to write a hypothesis. 
Okay, um, good. The, uh, the null is, um, this is a population proportion. So even though they gave us the claim in, as a percentage, we're gonna convert that to a, to a decimal and use a proportion because P is going to be a population proportion. And the counselor thinks that it's greater than 0 0.028. And this is the claim. Yeah, so um, generally, uh, uh, some of you are using the mean, mu. That's the variable that we use for a population mean. And this problem is more about a population proportion. So when we're making a claim about a population proportion, the variable that we use is going to be p and not mu. So notice we use p for a proportion or a percentage and mu for a mean. In our previous example, we were looking at the average number of ounces in a can of soda. In this one, we're just looking for a proportion. The total number that um, of students that you know, do these e-cigs out of the total student population or whatever the sample is. Writing hypotheses. All right, that's, uh, you're gonna do 300 of these probably by the time the, the semester is over. So it's very important that you get these correct. And this is the first step. And we'll be making claims about more than just a single population mean, more than just a single population proportion. We'll be comparing two proportions, comparing two means, There'll be claims made about a correlation coefficient. There'll be claims made about multiple means, more than two, multiple proportions, and so on. Okay. Um, uh, the step two is the, uh, the level of significance. And this is probably the easiest step because generally the level of significance is something that's gonna be given to you in the problem. This is our value of alpha. So all you have to do is to specify the value of alpha. And uh, alpha is equal to the probability of making a type one error. Right. So the level of significance is alpha. And you may recall that uh, alpha is equal to one minus C. C is the, the confidence interval level. So those two are related. And alpha is going to be a small number. It's usually, you know, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. It's the probability of making an error. We don't want to make an error. We don't want there to be a high probability of making an error. We want there to be a low probability of make, making an error. And so therefore, these numbers are generally small. And so if if alpha is equal to 0 0.05, then one minus 0 0.05 would be 0 0.95. So an alpha of 0 0.05 would correspond to a confidence level of 95%. Now, usually they give you this alpha in the problem. If they don't give it, um, uh, if alpha is not given, we're gonna use 0 0.05, that's kind of the standard that we use. So that means five times out of 100, we would make an error, one in 20. So we're willing to take that risk. All right, let's talk about the different errors that we can make. Now remember that the way that this uh, hypothesis testing process works is somebody makes a claim, maybe it's that you know the population proportion is 0.48. And if someone makes that claim, we assume that it's gonna be true. We calculate a, we go take a sample, we calculate the sample proportion and then we plot it somewhere on the scale. You know, maybe it's here, or maybe it's here, or maybe it's over here. It's somewhere in there. And we're gonna base our conclusion based on where this sample proportion falls. If the sample proportion falls in this range, less than two standard deviations from the mean or some other amount, then we're gonna say we don't have enough evidence to reject that the proportion is 0.48. However, if we get a sample mean way out here, or a sample mean, or not mean, but a sample proportion way out here, one of those, then we would say that, you know, we got this through a random process. It's very unlikely that the population proportion is 0.48 if when we tried to collect evidence, we found this out here. And we might find this and the population proportion might still be 0.48. We can make the decision 
to reject that the population proportion is 0.48 when in fact it's true because we got this one over here. We got this sample proportion over here or over here. So this line in the sand is going to determine, one of these lines in the sand is going to determine our decision. And we have no control over that. We can't just say, eh, I'm going to reject it this time. Eh, I'm not going to reject it this time. You're going to reject or not reject this claim based on where the sample proportion falls. Now, if we reject the claim because our sample proportion fell out here, but it was this result that we got from our one sample was just based on random sampling variation. And the true population proportion really was 0.48. We could make an error and reject the claim when in fact it's true. That's one of the errors we can make. We just want that error to be very small. So you have to be careful when you're um, you know, basing your results on a single sample because you can be wrong and you'll be wrong 5% of the time. All right, so there's a couple of errors that you can make. And given the uh, descriptive names of type one error and type two error. So let me show you where they, uh, how they fall. Uh, we're going to create a, a two by two grid. And up here, we're going to say the truth. All right, we, when we write our hypotheses, they are competing hypotheses. So in this column, we're going to say that the null hypothesis is true. And the alternative hypothesis is false. And over this one here, the null hypothesis is false. And the alternative is true. So only one of these two scenarios in every hypothesis test will occur. Now over here is going to be our decision. There's one of two decisions we can make. We can either reject the null hypothesis or not. And so let's go through these four scenarios, one, two, three, four, and identify if an error was made or not. All right, so for this first one here, uh, the null hypothesis is true and the alternative hypothesis is false. I'll just write it that way. Null hypothesis is true and the alternative hypothesis is false. Over in this column, we have the null hypothesis is false and the alternative hypothesis is true. Same thing down here. All right, so that takes care of the two columns. Now, when we go over to the rows, um, the way I will indicate that we reject the null hypothesis is that I'll just put a X through the null hypothesis. Okay. And the way that I'll represent that we do not reject the null hypothesis is that I'll just circle the null hypothesis here and maybe cross out the other one. So in every hypothesis test, one of these four situations is going to happen. Let's go through each one and identify if an error has been made. All right, in this first scenario, the null hypothesis was true. But when we went and collected our sample, our sample was quite a ways away from the null hypothesis value, so we ended up rejecting it. And what we did here then is we rejected the true statement in favor of a false statement, and this is an error. We don't want to reject the true statement. We want to accept the true statement. We want to reject the false statement. That's not what happened here. So this is an error. When we reject the null hypothesis, when in fact it's true, this is known as a type one error. That's one of the kinds of errors that we can make in a hypothesis test. All right, let's go over this scenario. In this scenario, the null hypothesis was false. And when we collected our sample and made our decision, we rejected the false statement in favor of a true statement. This is the correct decision. We hope that this happens a lot. Uh, on the other hand, this one here, in this one, the null hypothesis was true and we didn't reject it. We didn't reject it in favor of a false statement. So this also is a correct decision. And finally, the last scenario, the null hypothesis was false, the alternative was true, 
but we were unable based on our sample proportion or sample mean, we were unable to have evidence to reject the null hypothesis, not enough evidence to reject this false claim. So we accepted the false claim and we didn't support the true statement. So this is an error as well. And it's not the same kind of error because in this one, we, we failed to reject a false statement. This one over here, we rejected a true statement. Both are errors. This one down here is the other kind, the type two error. And the type two error is when we fail re to reject a false statement in favor of a true statement. Now we don't know this, but you know when we make the decision, we just kind of go about uh, our procedures and we reject when our results tell us to reject and we base our conclusion on, on that one sample. But if we did make an error, a type one error was when we rejected false statement in favor of, we reject a true statement in favor of a false statement. And the type two error is when we fail to reject a, fail, a false statement in favor of the statement that's true. And the probability of a type one error, we want to be small. And this is our alpha. This is our level of significance. So we established this at the beginning of the, of the hypothesis test. We established that we want the probability of making a type one error to be relatively small, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, something like that. Let's go back to uh, one of these problems here. Because uh, in 15 to 22, it says, we've already established the, the hypotheses. Here they are, right here for number 15. And uh, part B says, explain what it would mean to make a type one error. So the type one error is when we reject a true statement. So a type one error would be we reject that the proportion is 0.399 when in fact the proportion at Joliet Junior College is 0.399. In this context, what does making a type one error mean? That means we rejected the null hypothesis. We reject that the proportion of students at Joliet Junior College who will graduate with a BA degree is 0.399, when in fact, the proportion is 0.399. So, you know, use this, these words or something similar to describe in context what a type one error would be in this case. So we reject the true statement in favor of the false uh, in favor of a, a false statement when in fact, or you can say or is not greater than 0.399. So they want you to describe what the type one error means in this context. <clears throat> and part C would be to explain what it would make mean to make a type two error. The type two error. Now the type two error is when we fail to reject the null hypothesis when in fact it's false. So you just need to say that in terms of in words for this particular problem. So we fail to reject that p is equal to 0.399. I'm just writing this up without talking about students at JC, JJC when in fact, P equals 0.399 is false. All right, now normally what I would do is I would write this out in words, same thing here. So we fail to reject that the proportion of students at Joliet Junior College is 0.399, when in fact, the proportion of students at G JJC is in fact 0.399. Or when in fact, um, so type one, type two errors, and then how to interpret them. All right, now the last thing that um, we need to talk about for this section 
is how to state the conclusion. And this is step five. And again, I'll give you a template as to how you do that. Step five is to state the conclusion. And again, I'll give you a grid that will present four scenarios. And, uh, you know, where is the claim? And there's two places it can be. The claim is the null hypothesis or the claim is the alternative hypothesis. We write the word claim next to one of our hypotheses. And we will interpret the decision based on where the claim is. And then over here again is as we had before, this is the decision. And we're either going to reject the null hypothesis or we're going to fail to reject. So uh, I'm gonna write the null and alternative hypothesis here. And I'm just gonna work, write the word claim next to the null hypothesis here, whatever it is. And over here, same thing, but I'm going to write the claim in the alternative hypothesis. And, and then as before, as we reject the null hypothesis here, I'll indicate that by crossing out the null hypothesis. And in the second row, um, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is plausibly correct. And there are only four scenarios in a hypothesis test. You put the claim in either the null or the alternative. And then when you do the rest of the work, you're either going to reject the null hypothesis or not. That creates these four scenarios. Here's how you interpret the results. This is step five. You're going to say here that there is evidence. We never want to say there's proof because remember, our results are based on a single sample. There is evidence to reject the claim because that's what we did. That, and then you want to spell out in words what the claim is that the proportion of uh, students at JJC that graduate with a baccalaureate degree within six years is equal to 0.399. But this is how you start it. Over here, here we rejected the null hy hypothesis in favor of the claim. So we're gonna say there is evidence to support the claim that, and then you go and state into words what the alternative hypothesis said there in words. There is evidence to support the claim that the proportion of students that graduate from, from JJC is in fact larger than 0.399. All right, two more. This one down here, uh, we were unable to reject the claim. So what we're gonna say here is there is not enough evidence to reject the claim that, and again, we just spell it out in words. And then finally, this one here, we failed to reject the null hypothesis to support the claim. So what we're gonna say here is there is not enough evidence to support the claim. That, dot, 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 whatever that claim was, write it out in words. But those are the four scenarios, and this will help you to kind of, uh, it's, it gives you a template as to, you know, how you are going to uh, interpret a decision. And we are out of time, so I don't have opportunity to do some, so maybe I'll do some uh, problems from uh, a couple of interpretations so that you can then apply this to a couple of uh, these problems. So for example, 23, 24, 25, they all refer to problems up here and they say, state the conclusion. So I'll include a couple of these in the notes.